This is the story of Qantas Flight 72. At 9.32 a.m. local time on the 7th of October 2008, an Airbus A330 was on its way from Singapore to Perth, Australia, with 303 people on board. Even though the flight had been normal up to that point, that would soon change. At 4.40 a.m. UTC, the autopilot suddenly disconnected and the captain took control of the plane. This was weird, but what happened next was weirder. A series of error messages started to pop up on the plane's ECAM. The ECAM, or the Electronic Centralized Aircraft Monitor, is a system that displays important things about the plane. When something goes wrong, it displays error messages that you can then troubleshoot. But the warnings this crew got made no sense. They were getting stall and overspeed warnings at the very same time. In addition to all of this, the captain's attitude and speed indicators were all over the place. Nothing was making any sense about this plane. The captain suddenly realized that he could not trust his own instruments, and so he fell back onto the standby instruments and the first officer's instruments. Not knowing what was happening, they started to debug the errors that they were seeing. But unknown to them, things were about to get a lot worse. As the second officer was in the cabin, talking to the cabin crew members about the plane, the plane suddenly started to pitch down. The captain pulled back on the stick to arrest the plane's descent, but at first, nothing happened. His inputs had no effect on the plane whatsoever. But slowly, after a few seconds, the plane started to respond, and the dive started to ease. The plane slowly climbed back up to 37,000 feet. In the cabin, people had been thrown around, and people had been injured. But the A330 was under control, and the pilots were looking to put the plane down as fast as possible. As the A330 flew, the pilots were working through the huge backlog of ECAM messages. As they did, the plane inexplicably went into another dive. The captain, like before, pulled back on the stick, but the plane initially did not respond. For some reason, the A330 just wouldn't respond to the pilot's inputs for a few seconds. And like before, the plane started to bottom out again. After the second upset, the pilots noticed a new ECAM message at the top of the list. It read, Flight Control Alternate Law Protection Lost. In simple terms, the plane was telling them that the usual software protections that the A330 had, which protected the plane from stalls and overspeeds, were now gone. The pilots, in essence, were on their own. The pilots had no idea why this was happening. They were being hit with a barrage of warnings, and they had no way of silencing them. It was at this point that the pilots decided that they were not going to risk it, and they divert to Learmonth. As they made their way to Learmonth, the captain realized that the plane's auto-trim system was not working, and that he had to trim the plane manually. But the captain wasn't taking any chances. He had enough of the automation. He disconnected the auto-throttles and the autopilot. He did not know if the automation would cause another dive, and he did not want to find out. With the plane kind of stable, the captain inquired about the state of the cabin. Some people had sustained some serious injuries, so the captain declared a mayday. Even though the plane was stable, the pilots were still working through the huge list of errors on the ECAM. They contacted technicians on the ground over satellite to see what was wrong. As far as they could tell, all of the warnings they had had the number one Adaru in common. Cautiously, in consultation with the engineers on the ground, the pilots switched the number three primary computer off. Thankfully, that did not cause anything else to break. The pilots took the plane into a descent to prepare for the landing at Learmonth. Everyone on the ground was working overtime to provide the captain with every bit of information that he needed to fly his plane. The pilots really did have their hands full. Since a lot of the computers were having issues, they couldn't just punch in a GPS approach. They had to do it manually. The first officer was controlling the cabin pressure manually as the plane descended. That's how badly the automation on this plane was broken. In addition to that, the auto brake was also broken. They would have to manually brake when they landed. As they neared the airport, the captain put the plane into a series of left orbits to lose speed and altitude. Soon after that, the pilots made what I assume was a very tense approach and landed safely at Learmonth. After the harrowing flight, I assume that everyone must have just been grateful to be back on the ground. 
and the investigators had one big puzzle to unravel. How did a state-of-the-art airliner dive twice without ever being commanded to do so? A quick analysis showed that the plane's dives were caused by the elevators at the back of the plane, and those were controlled by the EFCS, or the Electrical Flight Control System. More specifically, the EFCS's Flight Control Primary Computers, or FCPCs. Digging into the computers, they found a bit of code that would pitch the nose of the plane down when it detected that the angle of attack was too high. Basically, if the computers thought that the plane was pitching up way too much, it would bring the nose down. But there was a small bug in the code. They found that the incorrect angle of attack data from one of the three sensors could cause an unintended pitch down. For that to happen, there needed to be two spikes in the AOA data, with the second spike following the first one by 1.2 seconds. Looking at the ADRU, or the Air Data Inertial Reference Unit, they found that the number one ADRU was acting strangely. The data that it outputted had certain spikes in it. Now, this could be because of bad data being fed into the ADRU by, let's say, a faulty AOA sensor, or it could be due to a calculation error within the ADRU itself. The ADRU manufactured by Northrop Grumman was sent to be tested, and they honed in on the processing module of the ADRU as the potential source of this problem. As far as they could tell, something had gone wrong when the CPU in the ADRU calculated the data, specifically something with memory retrieval. Now, the report goes into a lot of computer science detail. If you're interested in how the ADRU organizes and processes data, I encourage you to look it up. For example, while doing the calculation, the ADRU stores data in the RAM, and if something were to go wrong while the data was being retrieved, then the final results could be corrupted. Since this data was used elsewhere in the plane, a wrong signal could really mess with other systems. Interestingly, the FCPC, or the Flight Control Primary Controller, was designed to deal with spikes in the data, such as the ones that were generated by the corrupted ADRU. In fact, the ADRU had generated a lot of spikes, and the FCPC filtered all of those out. But remember how I told you that spikes that were 1.2 seconds apart could cause problems for the system? Well, as it turned out, in normal operations, the FCPC uses an average of the values between AOA1 and AOA2. If the values between the sensors started to deviate, the FCPC defaults to what's known as a memorization state. It samples the value from AOA sensor 1 and performs calculation using that value for the next 1.2 seconds. This usually works, but there was one scenario that the programmers had not accounted for the scenario where a spike happened right as that 1.2 second memorization period ended. In that case, as per the programming, the FCPC computer would accept the value of the spike as valid information and then would perform calculations based on the incorrect value of the spike. Essentially, a data spike at just the right moment had the potential to wreak havoc on the plane's computer systems. Here's a quote from the report. The problem was that if a 1.2 second memorization period was triggered, the FCPCs accepted the next value of AOA1 and AOA2 at the end of the memorized period as valid. In other words, the algorithm did not effectively handle the transition from the end of a memorization period back to normal operating mode when a second data spike was present. End quote. Now, the question becomes, how was such a flaw in the software never found and rectified? When you develop software, be it for a toaster oven or a giant passenger jet, you test it by throwing as many scenarios as you can think of at it. But sometimes, some fringe outlying cases slip through the cracks. In this case, when the A330 and the A340 were being flight tested, they found a few problems with the algorithm that calculated AOA values. So they redesigned the algorithm, and they accidentally introduced this flaw that went by unnoticed until the upset on Flight 72. Flaws like these aren't unheard of in software. If you feed your program weird data, sometimes you just get weird results. For example, a few years ago, you could brick your iPhone by changing its date to the 1st of January, 1970. But in that case, the worst case scenario was that you needed to take a trip to the Apple store. But in this case, you might be dealing with a barely controllable plane.
But let's get back to that initial fault in the CPU of the AdRu now, shall we? Now, I'm going to probably title this video something like How Space Particles Almost Caused a Plane to Crash, and I promise you that's not clickbait because the investigators never really got to the bottom of what really caused that flaw in the first place. Some speculated that it could be a high temperature thing or a hardware thing or a software issue, and some theories were literally out of this world. A hypothesis is that high energy particles interacting with the Earth's upper atmosphere release some secondary particles, and those particles then messed with the computer's chip in the Adaru. I mean, as outlandish as that sounds, space probes do have error correction mechanisms built into them to deal with this very problem. The probability of this happening is very, very, very low, but however, it isn't zero. They also checked to see if ground base or other radiation sources could have affected the plane in any way, but they just couldn't nail down the cause. What do you think caused this computer to malfunction? Do you think the cause for this near crash was otherworldly in nature? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.